It's the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Dickers. In this episode, I'm talking with Steve Kaplan, the film industry's most sought-after expert when it comes to making comedy screenplays work. What is the genesis of your interest in comedy? Well, uh, I think when you get right down to it, uh, I was beat up a lot as a, as a kid. And um, uh, you could only do two things when you're being beaten up. You could either learn to run fast or, or be funny and, and get them on your side. So um, uh, literally, uh, I learned to do both. I was a very quick runner, and um, I aspired to be a class clown, uh, although uh, I have to tell you I was very bad at being a class clown. Uh, people would look at me. <laughs> I think I was too smart for the room. People would look at me like, what? Um, but I became obsessed with comedy. I, I remember... Um, I, I must have been 11 or 12, and there was, I was at a dance, and there was a band, and they asked for, uh, they asked for um, you know, uh, songs, you know, what, what kind of songs would you like us to play? And people were saying, oh, you know, play a Beatles song. And, and I went up to them, and I, I, I remember this with, <laughs> with great embarrassment. I asked them to play Thanks for the Memory, because um, Bob Hope was one of my heroes, and uh, and I was, I was simply uh, obsessed at a very early age with, uh, with how to make people, how to make people laugh, uh, why people are laughing, uh, how to be funny. Um, I was cast in a, I, you know, th- this, is, <laughs> this is like a, a, a morbid uh, or, or, or pathetic uh, biography, but I was cast in a, in a play in, in, in eighth grade and... Uh, it was called Life of the Party, which no one has ever done. You know, one of those plays written for middle school kids. And I had, I was the funny kid who wasn't going to get the girl. And I had a scene in the, in the second act where I tried to get the girl and I fell down. And, and I remember I went off stage and I got a laugh, applause, exit. And to me, I said, that's my life. Now this was an uns- have, unscripted or unprepared moment. Uh, no, I you know well. I mean, it was in the play, and I rehearsed it. But I, it. I, I, I designed it so that I made this exit uh, and tripped over like about three or four chairs off stage. So I made a big, cl- big noise, and there was laughter, applause, and I, I just thought, I don't want to do anything else in my life. But, but do that and get that. Um, and I thought that I would go on to be the, the next great uh, character actor um, who would be in all the comedies. But that didn't work out because, as it turned out, I was not that good an actor. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned that story because a lot of comedians will say that same thing. Like the first time they got laughter from an audience, uh, they were hooked. And you got that, but it, instead of going into performing and you blame the fact that you're not a good actor, but most stand-up comics don't think of themselves as good actors necessarily, or that's not a, a prerequisite for doing stand-up. But you went in the direction of just deconstructing. Uh, well, actually, uh, I, I, I went, I, I, st- I tried to be an actor. I went to college, I, I studied, you know, I was, uh, I was a theater major, uh, I did plays, uh, but uh, I was too scared to do stand-up. Uh, I revered stand-up com- stand-up comedians, but I I couldn't get the gumption up to actually get up in front of and do it. Partly because I I wasn't, and this is this is kind of a funny uh, admission too. I wasn't a good writer. I didn't have anything to say. I could make jokes about lots of things, but I didn't have. I didn't have the burning desire to get up and, and comment on something or have a point of view about something. So, so the stand, stand-up never really worked for me. So I was a, I was a theatrical actor, um, but that wasn't really working for me too because I, I think I was, I was always thinking about the audience reaction, which is great if you're a director and terrible if you're an actor. So I became, I became a director because I, I could see the end result um, and I could see the end result of what I what I wanted the audience to to receive and what I wanted the performance to do, but I couldn't 
when you're in the moment as an actor, you don't want to be thinking of the end result. You want to be thinking of the process. So uh, I, I became by default a actor and a producer. I, we started with two other actors. This uh, off-off-Broadway company in New York called Manhattan Punchline. And it was a theater completely devoted to comedy. Um, because at the time in, in New York, uh, all the theater artists were taking themselves very seriously. I mean, you know, there was, uh, you know, if I had to see one more production of, uh, of Chekhov with people in black turtlenecks, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd have to kill myself. But um, I, I wanted to do a theater that was, again, that was completely devoted to, to comedy, to the plays, stand-up, improv. And, and a lot of great people came through Punchline. David Ives, who now is a you know, Tony-winning uh, playwright. Um, uh, David Crane did Friends. Peter Tolan, uh, actors like Nathan Lane and, uh, and Oliver Platt. Uh, and a lot of great people, you know, Michael Patrick King was, uh, was one of the uh, members of the first uh, improv group that we, that we produced and featured. Uh, Dom Herrera was also in that group. Lisa Mende was in that group. It was, you know, it was amazing. Um, and, uh, and so that's how I started to deconstruct comedy because I was producing it. I was directing it. I was having successes. I was having failures. And I would stand at the back of the theater every night because we had no money so I couldn't afford to hire anybody. So I would be at the theater every night and I would watch the show and I would notice that there were nights in which the play wasn't going off and the actors would come off stage and they would say, well, this audience is terrible. But I was in the audience and I, I wasn't terrible and I started to notice that there were different things occurring on those nights when the, when the comedy wasn't working. And out of that came, came this exploration for, for what is happening. Why is something funny on a Thursday and no longer funny on a Sunday? What is going on? It can't just be a, 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 a lousy audience. Something is happening. And so I started to devise... Uh, acting exercises because I was teaching an improv class at the time and exercises and games to try to to try to get at what what I thought was or might be the the levers and fulcrum the the to to discover as my friend Brian Rose used to say the the physics of comedy and and out of that came a a 40 week master class in which I started to invent these uh, these tools that I thought, oh wow! So, so this is one of the tools that that can make a, a, a scene funnier, and nobody knows about it. Now, when you were teaching improv, were you using any kind of established method, like you know, maybe from the Second City or something, or were you kind of inventing this as you were going along? No, I, I mean, I, I started. Um, uh, I started with Spolin. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I was. I think I. Uh, this is before UCB, so right. um, uh, I don't think I was aware of Keith Johnstone at the time. Uh, but we all we all did Spolin. I I actually did a year in the Virginia penal system, <laughs> not as a prisoner, but I was part of a uh, of a federally funded improv group uh, that went into prisons and taught prisoners improv, um, and we can we can talk about the you know the the idiocy of, of well, this that seems what, like crazy ahead of its time like i can imagine that happening now and people thinking oh yeah i can see the therapeutic benefits of improv but i guess i'm assuming you're talking about maybe 20 years ago or more uh i'm talking about the 70s yeah, yeah no that, so, that so. Uh, just does not seem possible so this is this is or maybe this it's is, just like the feel good 70s you know let's all express our great- feelings thing this this was the brainchild of, of a guy named Jerry Hodgson, who now is um, uh, he's like uh, the director, you know, the head of a theater department somewhere in Wyoming. But uh, but yeah, it was it was a little bit part of the the, the hippie generation. Sure. And we would go into we would go into uh, uh, prisons, 
and uh, we would perform a play, a short play, uh, and and then we would gather the next day with a selected group of prisoners, and we would go through a, I, I think it was like a three-week or two-week improv course where we discovered that these guys knew how to improvise much better than we did hmm. because you know it, in a lot of ways that was their life but it was it was eye opening um uh you know we went to a uh, uh a women's prison we went to a maximum security prison where a guy sidled up to me and showed me a picture of of a woman who said you you see this woman and i said yeah he said i killed her <laughs> and oh, then geez. he wasn't he wasn't kidding. Uh, uh, and then there was a guy, an, another guy whose nickname was Happy because you know, he was always, or no, Smiling. Smiley, I think his name was. And he was always smiling because, um, and we said, uh, somehow somebody had the temerity to say, how'd you get in there? And he said, well, I, I you know, when I got out of uh, the Navy, I didn't have any money. So I, I started robbing uh uh, Burger Kings or McDonald's or something like that, and 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 what what he did was he would go into a place and he would say, uh, you know, uh, you know, sing the song, you know, sp- you know, special orders won't forget us, whatever it was, <laughs> and and they would say what he said, no, sing the song, and then they would say, no, we don't want to sing the song, and then we'd pull out a big gun and he said, now sing the song, and he would make them, say, now of course this is. Did this really happen? I don't know, but this is what he told us. But it's a funny so this story. Is, like that's, there's a lot of comedy in that. Oh, I know. So, so they were funnier than we were, and um, uh, and we would. Uh, that's how I learned how to do improv, um, and that's how I learned uh, that I was only okay at performing comedy and not really that good. Um, but uh, I had a lot of enthusiasm for it. I wonder if the reason why prisoners are funny, or you found prisoners, these prisoners anyway, to be funny, is similar to the reason why. Uh, babies and old people um, and, and animals are funny because they're they're totally unaware. They're just living their life the way they have to live it. Uh, every almost everything is kind of like life and death. There's such a seriousness to them that that creates such a great contrast. So they become hilarious to us who are conscious of the mechanics of comedy. Well, in a way, it, it's a comedia troupe. You have you have the innocent fool, like the guy who said, "I killed her." Right. Um, but then, but then you have uh, most of them are are Arlecchinos and Pedrolinos and Brigellas. They're all sorts of clever, tricky, crafty servants who are looking for the sharp end of the stick. Um, and they, you know, uh, on the streets, they had to improvise all the time, lying and cajoling and, and threatening and, and sweet talking. And so they, they took to improv like ducks to water. They were great. Uh, in fact, in this one prison, I, I think in Bland, it was, uh, they started a group. They called Wings, and, and it continued for several years, I understand. Uh, a, this, this prisoner's improv group that they did, they did all sorts of, they created stories, their own stories out of, out of improvisation. Um, but, but so I, you know, so, so skip ahead, uh, you know, uh, 10 years, and I, I'm, I'm at Punchline, Manhattan Punchline, and I'm starting to deconstruct this stuff. And, uh, and of course, I thought, well, listen, I'm, I'm just teaching this to, to a, a bunch of kids. And they happen to be, you know, a bunch of wildly talented kids. Um, but, uh, and I, I always thought, uh, you know, real comedians know this stuff, you know. Uh, they just don't teach this stuff in, in college acting classes. And then I thought, oh, well, who, you know, uh, th- this doesn't make any sense. And somebody said to me, literally, um, about 20 years before I wrote the book, uh, you should write a book about this. And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, but not only was I not a, a, a great actor, uh, I, 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 was, I was a worse writer because I, I would, uh, and maybe you know something about this because I come to, I come to comedy from the performance end. I taught, I was a director. I taught actors. Um, and then I realized, uh, and somebody t- said to me, you can teach this stuff to writers. Uh, and, and you come from a, a writing background. Yeah. If I'm, uh, I would sit down and I would, I would write a sentence 
and it would seem like the stupidest, most obvious, worst sentence in the world, and that would be that would be that writing for the week. Right. Uh, and and so the guy who ran the Robert McKee or was working for Robert McKee uh, and running his story seminars all over the country and the world came to me and said, you could do for comedy what uh, Robert McKee does for story. So I said, okay. And so we started, we started doing these seminars and I started getting pretty good feedback. Were you working with this guy from McKee sort of under his umbrella or were you branching out on your own at that point? No, this guy was working, was branching out from McKay. I mean, I wasn't gotcha. working with McKay. Okay, um, so he was like managing your your events. He was he was prese- putting on putting on events. Got he it. was presenting events, um, and uh, and I started I started just taking a digital recorder and taping taping it because I found that if I had the recording transcribed. Then I could do what I do best, which is edit. Um, because uh, as as a director, I've always been really good at taking somebody else's writing and making it better. Um, uh, working with working with writers and uh, and for the most part, boy, this is great. But how about if you do this here and let's put in this joke there? So I found that my real skill was in uh, was in. Doctoring, even though you know uh, most script doctors are, are writers to begin with, but I I was a a director and a a failed actor and a failed funny person, uh, so that's how I wrote my book. I I literally taped myself, transcribed it, and then when I looked at the transcription, I was able to make it better as though I as though I had no connection to the person who was doing all this talking. Yeah, that's um, interesting. I, and you hear a lot of people now advising people who want to write a book to do it that way, to dictate your first draft because it's so much easier to edit. I don't think you're alone in that regard. Oh, because, yeah, it was it was if I had to write uh and I'm I'm working on another book now. Um uh a uh I'm I'm uh uh, ripping off uh, Chris Vogler, who ripped off Joseph Campbell. Uh, <laughs> right. Chris, who wrote uh, the uh, the Writer's Journey, uh, yeah. which ripped off Joseph Campbell's The Hero of a Thousand Faces. So I'm ripping off both of them, and I'm writing the Comic Hero's Journey and talking about story structure uh, in in comedy. Um, that'll, so be, that'll be good. I'm, I'm I'm doing the same thing. I'm I'm basically uh, it's part of my it's part of my weekend workshops and. We we I talk about stuff and then I I record it and then I start working on hey this guy who said this <laughs> was pretty good I'm gonna write I'm gonna oh I could say that better so that's one of that's great so your your first book the hidden tools of comedy is it's still primarily geared to screenwriters and performers am I correct in that assumption I I always thought that that uh, comedy is is especially performance comedy. I want to differentiate between performance comedy and and humor writing, which which I, I don't really discuss because humor writing is is great. But uh, my focus has always been on the the performative aspects of comedy, uh, comedy that is spoken by human beings to be heard by human beings in in whatever venue you could find, and. Uh, my my thought was always that comedy is a unified art form unlike any uh, unlike any other performance art form i mean for you know uh chaplin uh billy crystal woody allen uh, you know uh, steve martin they're writing it they're directing it they're they're performing it chris rock um uh, and you don't find this you don't you certainly don't find this in in drama I can't. Can you think of? I mean, Clint Eastwood uh, directs and and acts in it, but he doesn't write it. Yeah, there's like, uh, I guess Orson Welles. Um, yeah, Clint Eastwood doesn't write. Um, uh, Orson Welles didn't write. Didn't write uh, Citizen Kane. That's true. He he did do a lot of writing, but I think he was primarily an editor and a rewriter. Right. Um, so yeah, Woody, so Woody Allen comes to mind, but again, that's comedy. So yeah, you're right. So I I can't think of. Uh, I can't think of uh, uh, a uh, a performer uh, who who is on all sides of the issue 
other than in comedy. Um, so, uh, so you know, maybe there is somebody. I'm, I'm. Maybe there's a a, a Japanese writer, director, <laughs> actor right. that I I'm unaware of. But it's it's rare. It's, it's rare. I mean, I, a couple of, uh, that pop into mind is Sylvester Stallone, who wrote Rocky, and I believe he won an Academy right. Award or at least was nominated. I can't remember. No, no, you're right. You're right. And then uh, Vin Diesel got started with a an independent film that he wrote and starred in, and directed. I think. Okay, now, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> no, but your, your point is made. It's very rare, and it's much more frequent in comedy. I would agree with that. So, so I always thought that comedy was a, a unified art and that everything that I was talking about in terms of the, the hidden tools, because, because there are people before me who have ta- talked about how to write jokes and, and, and all, uh, a whole range of things to do when, when you're doing comedy. But what I thought was I had, I had chanced upon a, a way of looking at comedy. I used to call it approach to comedy, which, which sounds more like how to mount a horse. Uh, uh, I, because it was, it was a, a very specific set of discrete usable practical tools that you could apply when things don't work as opposed to a method that you had to follow in order to be funny because if it was a method you had to apply in order to be funny how do all those other people do it without me so 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 for me it was always more like um like what stanislavski did um stanislavski was a uh, a mediocre uh, actor and and director, um, uh, and uh, but he was a great observer. And what he did was he simply observed what made great acting in Russia, and tried to distill it to its usable uh, uh, elements. And and that's what I've and so I've done. I mean, I didn't invent comedy. Uh, comedy was here before me and will be here long after me, but I tried to figure out what is actually happening that that is identifiable and and understandable uh, and can be utilized in various uh, different scenarios and narratives. Yeah, and you've been very successful at that. Your goal of sort of being the Robert McKee of comedy, I think, has totally come true. You're kind of the go-to guy. And I want to I want to talk about that a little bit, but I also want to talk about what that's led to for you, which is consulting. Because you do a fair amount of script consulting and script doctoring as well, don't you? Yeah, um, uh, a lot, a lot of, for individuals, um, uh, not so much for... Uh, uh, U.S. companies, um, but uh, a lot for foreign companies. Australia, I do a lot of work uh, in uh, in uh, Sweden, um, uh, England, uh, New Zealand. And do you find that to be similarly easy to editing your own book? You see a script and it's like, oh, well, this would be funnier if you just did X, Y, and Z. Uh, well... Y- I, I guess the answer is yes, because um, uh, in a way, when I'm reading a script, uh, I, I, re- I start to feel like I know what the script wants to be, sometimes better than the, act, than, than the producer or, or, the, or the writer. Uh, and when I start to talk to them about it... Um, uh, one of the things that, that, that make it easier, or not easier, but one of the things that, that I find is that uh, they're, f- they're focused on very practical things, and they're focused on, uh, let's make it funnier. And, and I start to focus on the meaning, on thematic. And when, when, when I start to talk to them about, well, the, 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 the screenplay is about this, and this is what's important. And this is the overall, you know, this is the overall theme. So if that's the overall theme, why is this happening? Shouldn't that be happening? And, to, and, and in a lot of cases, the theme of, of a movie, what, what pulls a movie together 
is, is not the most important thing that they're thinking about because there's so many other things that they're trying to think about. Um, and so when I'm, uh, I, I, have the, I have the luxury of, of coming from the outside and, and looking at um, the whole of it and trying to make sense of the whole of it. Uh, and then, and then I, I also apply uh, a, a few... A few very usable tools, like um, the you know the in 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 the hidden tools of comedy, we talk about the tool of winning, which is you know it's just basically a sense of uh, what Chris Rock says. If if a character is in this situation, what would he do? What would he want to do? And and a lot of times when people are writing comedy, they're trying to think what would be the funny thing to do. And oftentimes, the funny thing to do isn't what the character would do. Yeah. And if you follow what the character would do, that will bring you to comedy as opposed to funny. Because one of the things, because um, I've been, I've been um, uh, looking at your book, uh, which I think is great, and I'm going Thank to start you. recommending it as, as a great way of, because uh, you really understand how to craft, craft writing and craft a joke. Yeah, which and, is, and, you know, and, and it's more about the prose writing as opposed to the performance, clearly. But, but, but also, when you're talking about joke writing, I mean, that's applicable to, to sitcoms, that's applicable to, oh, sure. uh, to, to movies, and, and the idea of the subtext of the joke, which, um, which uh, by the way, I, I'm, uh, I, I've talked about in a different way, but now I'm going to steal outright. <laughs> but, but just know, Scott, when I steal, I always give credit. That's, uh, I always say. I always say this is what Michael Haig says. This is this is now. I'm going to say this is what Scott Dicker says. So, <laughs> believe that's not stealing. Uh, so, <laughs> well, I guess it's not stealing. It's it's borrowing, but then handing back with interest. <laughs> right. uh, in in your book, you talk about the laughs, and the first thing I talk about in my in my workshops in my book is that, especially for performance comedy, which is, and I I, I put stand up off to the side because that's a very that's a different animal but if you're writing plays if you're writing screenplays if you're writing sitcoms uh, there's a difference between funny and comic funny is whatever makes you laugh I have a niece if I shake my keys at her she will laugh is that comedy could I pitch that to Les Moonves here are my keys Les look at the keys no so, so funny, it, to, to chase after funny is, is a losing proposition. And exhibit one, every bad sitcom that you can think of, every bad sitcom that's on the air today, chases funny. But comedy is the thing that tells the truth about human beings. And so human beings, silly and, and scared and fallible as they are, try to do things that make their lives better. And so the idea that uh, why is this character trying to do X? What? How does that help him? That that's the first. That's one of the first things I, that helped me when I'm reading a screenplay. Um, you know, to just try to figure out what do the characters really want to do? Why are that? Why are they having this fight there? Don't they want? Don't they want to have sex that night? You know, uh, because a lot of times writers are thinking about what they want to do. Right. And uh, what I call top-down writing, yeah, and where, nothing, where they're pushing pieces around. Uh, yeah, and nothing kills the comedy faster than when you're reading, say, a screenplay. And you, you're you getting to know these characters. And maybe they they fit into certain archetypes, or at least they have traits that you're understanding. And then all of a sudden, the screenwriter tries to tell a joke because they think this is a, a comedy screenplay. It totally takes you out of the, the story and the movie. Because, wait a minute, these characters wouldn't do that. And I, I do think exactly. that's, a, that's a big issue, that'll, and I, I would say a huge mistake that most, uh, especially beginning comedy screenwriters make. Yeah, they're, they're trying to make it funnier than it is, and, right. and it doesn't need to be funny, it just needs to be human. And one of the things that I, I, I teach or I harp on is that, is that human beings by themselves are funny. I mean, if you don't believe me, go to a Thanksgiving dinner and look right. around the table. And, and, and uh, you know, when cousins get together and they talk about their uncles and aunts and moms and dads, they're always laughing because those people are ridiculous. Yep. 
and 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 you don't need to make stuff up. So, so uh, when I when I look at a screenplay, we look at uh, uh, are the characters being true to themselves? Um, are they are they uh, uh, are they under are they understandable? Are they are they um, f- are they some kind are they in some kind of archetypical form? Um, uh, sometimes there'll be three best friends. You really need three best friends. Uh, one one of the things that we we talk about is, is the sense that uh, all Western comedy uh, comes from uh, Commedia dell'art comes from a performative improvisational background. Yeah, and you mentioned that before. From that, from the Commedia dell'art, do you find that certain archetypes are still relevant and maybe some of the best practices for today, like certain archetypes that really work well and certain archetypes that really don't work well anymore? Well, it's not so much it's the archetypes, it's the relationship between the archetypes. Um, uh, the fact that these relationships... Uh, appear and reappear and reappear and and you you know for people who are writing comedy w- which i think are sometimes different from students of comedy uh they they don't you know sometimes they don't realize that there's a reason why there are three stooges why there are three marx brothers you know and they've got they got rid of zeppo um that that there are um uh, that these relationships and and uh, John Stone talks about status, you know, the fact of uh, high, you know first zany and second zany, high status, low status, right. and status negotiations. That that those relationships create story. Um, one of the things um, uh, I, I I talk about is uh, is you know we we first we talk about what the various archetypes are like um the inamorata the young lovers and the arlecchino the uh, the zanies the the servants and so i say I, I i'll tell people okay let's put two dim young lovers we're in the commedia let's put two dim young lovers on a park bench what's their physical movement and you know and people will say well they're they're young they're good looking they're a little dim they're going to kiss so their physical movement is together let's take away the young man and let's put in the pantalone the lecherous old man and now what's the movement and then they'll say well now the now he's going to the girl and the girl's going to run away but because they're like you know it's a commedia and they're in a, a courtyard they're going to she's he's going to chase her around the bench now let's take away the young girl let's put in the marionetta the battle axe wife who's seen him chasing after a young girl now what's the movement now she's going to chase him the other way around the bench let's take both of the old people away let's put in three zanies and they're all going to go in different directions, but because they're idiots, they're going to knock heads and they're going to knock each other out. And so what does the Commedia teach us? The Commedia teaches us that, that character creates plot. Character creates movement. Character creates action. If you put the right characters into the scenario, they will create their own action, uh-huh. as opposed to you having to invent stuff. I think that's that's very true. How do you distinguish between comedic characters and dramatic characters? Because the way you were talking about comedic characters a moment ago, it was like they're real people, and you know yeah. you have to ask what they're really like. But a lot of times in comedy, I don't think people want real characters. They want characters that are more of a representation of real people. They're a little stupider. Or they're a type. Um, how do you distinguish when you when you're working through a script with somebody? Uh well. You might have a guy who's the stupid guy, right? Um, is that going to be the, the, the protagonist of your story? Probably not. But the protagonist of your story is going to have a stupid guy who's a friend who will, be, who will, will generate some of the, com- some of the comedy. Uh, simply because his point of view, his worldview is going to create like Phoebe and Friends is going to create some of the comedy simply by the way that they see the world. And so, and so uh, without, without becoming academic about it, you know, Phoebe is, you know, Phoebe in Friends is kind of a commedia archetypical character. But you still have your, your regular guy who is, um, or a regular girl who is capable of both idiocy and, and sublime um, sweetness, uh, and one of the ways you do that is by uh, 
adding and detracting skills, what, what we call non-hero. So let's take Bill Murray at the beginning of Groundhog Day. He's a jerk, right? Yeah. And he's, and he's an acerbic, witty, funny jerk. Um, but he's also got to be the uh, lead in a romantic comedy. So what do you do? How do, how, do you, how do you do that? What you do is when you want him to be dramatic and romantic, you give him skills. And one of the, you know, uh, or just awareness, awareness of his situation is a skill and creates a dramatic moment. So in the middle of the movie, when he's all depressed and he just looks up at the camera and says, it's going to, it's cold out there. It's cold out there. You know, and, and it's a very sad moment because he, it's the, it's during that long sequence when he's become despondent that creates a dramatic moment when he's sweet and, and, and empathetic to, uh, to Andy McDowell, when he says, I could, uh, I could draw your face from, from memory, you know, and he's just so loving to her, that's a skill, so it makes him romantic. But then when he, you know, when, uh, when he uh, realizes for the first time that he can do whatever he wants uh, on Groundhog Day because there's no consequences. And uh, Stephen Tobolowsky, uh, the insurance salesman, comes up and says, Phil? Phil Connors? And he says, Ned? And he just punches Ned right, right yeah. in the face with, without any, uh, you know, without any uh, prologue. Um, that's th- that, uh, you know, that is comic because he, we've taken away empathy. We've taken away, uh, discretion. So you take, you, you, a non-hero is somebody who lacks some, if not all the required skills and tools. So characters, especially the main protagonists can, can, uh, have skills and that makes it more dramatic Take uh, take the skills away, or let there be n- uh, less skills, and it makes it more comedic. So for you, it's within a story, within a script, a character can transform as needed, scene by scene. Yeah, without without changing their essential DNA. Right. They can they can descend sort of into a more two dimensional comedic character uh, when they need to for a laugh, as for, long as they're for the time. To- right for the time being. Right. Because as long as they're because as long as they're not violating the rules of their character. Straight line, wavy line is the idea that there is no such thing as a straight man in a comic. There is, however, a straight line somebody who's who's uh, living with blinders on, kind of going in a straight line, like on a track, and a wavy line, somebody who's struggling with that but doesn't quite know how to solve it because they're a non-hero, and that can switch moment to moment. So there are moments in which the the person who's struggling is our emotional focus. So if you if you look at any sitcom or, 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 or movie, at any one moment, in many moments, uh, and there are, there are times in which there is no straight line, wavy line, there is no focus like that, you, you have focused your story on who you want the audience to empathize, to, to care about, your emotional focus. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a tool in which one character is acting like an idiot and the other character is just kind of sometimes just looking at him, not knowing what to do. Uh, when John Cleese first started Pi- uh, Monty Python, when they first started Monty Python, John Cleese said they thought comedy was watching somebody do something silly. They later came to realize, he says, that comedy is watching somebody watch somebody do something silly. That, that was one of the discoveries that, that I made, what, 35 years ago, that I said, wow. No one, nobody's talking about this, but that's really where the comedy is. It's not the person who's doing the funny stuff, it's the reaction. Right. It's, it's, and it's actually the teamwork, because you can't have Mork without Mindy. Without Mindy, there's no Mork. Yeah, it's it's a, just noise. It's a very interesting way to look at it, the whole idea of the relationship, because to me, being practically on the autism spectrum, it's about contrast, it's about the straight and the funny. Uh, but to you, a normal human being, it's about the relationship, <laughs> and I can totally see what you're what you're talking about. Look at a Seinfeld. Seinfeld is Jerry's the straight man, and George and Kramer are the comics. But the comedy is created by Jerry kind of looking at Kramer and not quite knowing what to do with him, even though he's his friend. Right. On the one hand, you're my friend, but on the other hand, you're fucking crazy. But on the other hand, 
you're the guy I let in my room. So, so, and, and. But then, like you said, also, the real comedy is created by us watching Jerry watch them. Exactly. And, and so it doesn't require Jerry to be shooting out punchlines all the time. And if you look at a Seinfeld, the person who's in focus is often simply quiet. Right. Like, you know, uh, and and one of the th- one of the real benefits is that you don't have to write so many jokes. Yeah, if you've got good comedic characters, just let them go. Let them do what they need to do. One one of the one of the things that I uh, again talking about talking about characters and relationships. One of the things that I do is we do a, a premise exercise because one of the things I agree with you is that premise is everything. I'm glad you brought that up. If you don't have a good comedy premise, I don't care how good your script is or how good your characters are. It's just not going to fly. Or or it's going to be very very quiet. I mean, like you can have a really you can have a sweet film like. Um, uh, uh, like the the film that Julia Louis Dreyfus and the late great James Gandolfini did, Enough Said, in which uh, you know this masseuse is dating this guy who happens to be the ex husband of the new best friend you're massaging, and who always is talking bad. I mean, that's a very quiet little premise. Not a high concept. Yeah, and there there are movies Not, like that. It's just, um, but but they don't do as but well. You know, they don't right? But well. it's still it's still what I call. Uh, impl- in, uh, it's a, still a comic premise because it's still implausible or impossible. Now, that's implausible. Is it really plausible that you're going to be best friends with the ex-wife of your new boyfriend? Probably not. And if, and if you did, would you not say anything? Probably not. Right. So, so that's, so, but I agree with you. If you don't have a good premise, then, you're, then it's not that you can't have a good comedy. What happens is, is the... Is the the com- the the compulsion to make it funny is going to make you make shit up? Yeah. You're inventing lots of shit to make it funnier. Whereas if you simply had a better premise to begin with, funny stuff would happen by itself. Right. The premise has to set you up for right the right kinds of characters and the right kinds of relationships that will be funny. Exactly. So, so for instance, so we do this comic premise where I, I, I you know, we, we might have uh, 40 or 80 or 120 people in a room, and I'll break them up into groups, and I'll say, okay, come up with a premise. I don't care about, you don't have to tell me the cast of characters, you know, just, just tell me, you know, just come up with a funny premise. And uh, as an example, I'll say, um, in an in a earlier group, uh, an earlier workshop, a group came up with this comic premise. Um, a, uh, a college team, football team discovers that the only time that they can win is when they get the nerd laid. But they get the nerd laid. And I'll say, you know, you might not like this movie. You might not want to write this movie. You might not even want to see this movie. But the fact is, is that a premise is a tool that, that, that starts writing the movie in your imagination. It does some of the work for you. So, for instance, Scott... In this movie, what see you know? Even if it's a t- it's a terrible movie, you don't want to see it. Uh, what scenes do you say? Yeah, no, I saw immediately when you said the idea. I I thought now that's a great concept for a comedy script because it's got built-in contrast. It's got the big burly jerks totally contrasted with the nerdy, probably socially awkward guy. It sets up a great conflict because we all know nerds don't get laid. The football players right. know how to get laid. Like there's so much contrast built into just every part of those relationships. So yeah, you can see the whole movie. You can see. Yeah, you, you can and, see. And, and the power of a premise is that it writes the movie for you. Right. You know, you're 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 thrown into the you're, you're propelled into the idea. And and you actually have to say, whoa. So so for instance, who are the characters in the movie? You got the the jerks, the Okay, you got players. okay. Well, okay. Well, well, who's the main ball player? Uh, he's probably like the captain of the the football team or whatever. What what position is he? Uh, he's, he's the quarterback. Quarterback, and he has two friends. Who are his friends? Uh, he's got probably a big dumb friend. Okay, the linebacker, and who sure. else? <laughs> and he's got uh, probably a smart friend. Because okay, he's a kind smart of, he's, friend. He's like an everyman. He's in between. So there's like. 
a guy okay. who's, who's got a dichotomy. Yes, he's a he's a big burly football player, but he's like a genius. So he's okay, the one okay. who crafts the plan to how to get the nerd oh. late. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, is that you see, you're a bright guy. Nobody's ever come up with that before. Okay, who else is in the movie? You got the nerd. You've got the nerd, uh, and I know how oh, this else? movie ends too. I totally well, know well before we get before we get there, <laughs> all right. Before well, we so get the there. nerd, uh, uh, who else is, is like in the, the, movie? the nerdiest get... kid on campus? Can't you know? Okay, nobody we got likes him. him. Yeah, got you got it. Quarterback, linebacker, the running back who's also a genius, brilliant. We got the nerd. Who else? Uh, the the girl. The girl. And I say okay. one girl because I think there will be a few like bimbo girls yeah. early, but there's ultimately going to be one girl that's going to cause a real problem. Ab- absolutely. And uh, and what what relationship does she have the t- to the team? Uh, you could go a number of different ways, but if it's somebody that is actually dating somebody on the team, and there's a situation where oh the nerd has to have sex with the quarterback's girlfriend in order for them to you're win. You're so you're so ahead of me. Okay, I would have said just the cheerleader, but you're right. Okay, uh, and maybe and and isn't there a coach? Oh yeah, sure. There's a mentor coach character. And and uh, how is the girl related to the coach? Well, if you want more conflict, uh, the daughter, obviously. Daughter. Okay. So so he, here's here's what I do in my workshop. Um, quarterback. Uh, okay, nerd, Steve Carell, quarterback, Paul Rudd, linebacker, Seth Rogen, running back, Romney Malco, girl, a young Catherine Keener, coach, Jane Lynch. You've just given me the cast of 40-Year-Old Virgin. There's a reason why these relationships appear and reappear and reappear because they, they create story. Right, they work. They cre- yeah, because they create story. Yeah. They they generate their own storylines, as opposed to uh, when people write scripts and well, this character's like this and this character's like that. I said, but how do they, how do they help tell the story? How do they function together? So that's one of the things that Commedia teaches us is that is that the, a Commedia troupe uh, would run around Europe with six or eight or ten actors all playing specific parts, never changing those parts. There was no you know no casting. Uh, and they would t- be able to tell every story so that comedy is a closed universe. Characters have to function within that closed universe. And so, and so you asked me way, way long ago what our characters are still, um, are still useful. Yeah, uh, in, uh, in features, and I think the rules are different in, in sitcoms, but in features you have to have a trickster. You don't, I don't necessarily, the trickster doesn't necessarily have to be the person who's the protagonist, but there needs to be a trickster. There needs to be somebody who breaks the rules. There needs to be a fool, somebody who's, who's, you know, ignorant of the rules or ignorant of, of, of life itself. There needs to be an innocence that could be the fool or that could be a, a different character, the rookie, the new guy. There needs to be a, a voice of reason, what you said, you know, the, the Paul Rudd, um, there, there need, there needs to be an angel of love. Even if it's not a romantic comedy, there needs to be some angel that is going to, tr- you know, help people transform. And then there needs to be a, a primal character. The primal character could be an antagonist, but doesn't need to be, you know, it needs to be, you know, like a, a Bluto in animal house. You, you see these characters, which are drawn right from the Commedia, which are, uh, are typical, iconic characters in, in, in almost every movie. Uh, and, uh, and then variations, variations of, of the above, so that, so that they, tell, they help tell the story. But you, I can't think of a good comedy without a trickster. Yeah, no, that's a great sort of umbrella way of looking at comedy movies and the way they're structured. Uh, very helpful. I th- a lot of people actually ask me, and I'm wondering what your advice is for this. You start telling them about the Commedia dell'arte, and they want to know, well, how can I learn more about this? How can I learn more about these characters? Is there is there a source that you go to that really lays it out well? Um, no, <laughs> actually, unfortunately, no. I mean, there yeah, there's the there's the internet, um, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, but but really, it's it's what what we did. What was your favorite favorite comedy when you were a kid? 
Oh, there were a few. Uh, the Blues Brothers, Ferris Bueller, I'll, are just a couple. Raising Arizona. Love Raising Arizona. I mean, so, so I think I think the just the idea that there are uh, that there are these different kind of characters, and then trying to see their iterations, their many iterations, in all the movies that you love, and trying to make sense of it. So yeah, there's. I don't think there's one great book on on Commedia, um, but there's a lot of information uh, on the web. Um, uh, there's just the idea that that comedy did not develop the same way that that drama did. Um, you know, comedy and drama were the same in Greece. Uh, they were stru- they were actually structured exactly the same uh, when. Uh, when uh, the uh, Roman Empire fell, there was a thousand years of illiteracy in Europe, uh, so there were no playwrights. Uh, drama reappeared on the church steps, and therefore drama became a vehicle to tell, uh, to, to um, communicate morals or lessons. But comedy developed uh, through roaming bands of actors, playing archetypical characters that had been identified since Greek times and, and then added to as, as various, uh, uh, peop, you know, various types came up and people wanted to make fun of them. Um, and they, they developed, like the Commedia dell'Art, as an actor-centric, character-based art form. The Commedia had no scripts. They were completely improvised. It was all character. And so modern comedy uh, is really uh, a, a development of, of Commedia, Commedia players where, I mean, if you look at television um, and you think about Commedia, Commedia was a group of characters that stayed the same, but the situations changed. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. So... So if you look at it from that point of view, characters are characters everything in comedy. And so therefore you're always looking for for similarities. Um and uh and the other th- you know, one of the things that I, I always recommend is to steal like crazy. Now I think you in your book you say something about oh, you know, it's not like you're stealing jokes, but but you're stealing everything else. You have to you have to steal the form because it's it's what people understand. Yeah, and you have to and and it's okay to steal to steal ideas and and then transform them in, into your own ideas because Monty Python is simply the Goon Show but done by those six guys. Right. Uh, the Goon Show was done by three guys on radio. Monty Python was done by six guys on television, but it's the same show. Uh, Woody Allen is basically doing Bob Hope. He has said that. He's acknowledged that. But because Bob Hope is, you know, kind of a uh, a Gentile from Cleveland by way of London, and Woody Allen is a Jew from Brooklyn, it comes out different. But it's the same womanizing, co- you know, cowardly womanizer. Uh, so Picasso said, "Good artists create. Great artists steal." So I, I you know, I always encourage people to take what you like and and transform it i mean one of my favorite movies not the best movie in the world but one of my favorite movies is is the farrelly brothers movie there's something about mary mm-hmm. and there's a great scene in, in in the movie in which uh ben stiller gets his dick caught in a zipper what could be funnier than that Comedy but the way gold. that they do it exactly but the way that they do it is they steal the 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 stateroom scene from night at the opera in which everybody is piling into the bathroom to take a look at poor Ben Stiller in his terrible tuxedo, uh, you know, trying to, trying to unzip his dick. Yeah. The, the tricky thing with the advice of, of steel and you know, like you said, I give this advice too with caveats. I find that a bigger problem with a lot of beginning writers is they are actually stealing jokes and they're using cliches, which are other people's jokes that they're just repurposing. And it's a much rarer problem that somebody is too original that you just can't understand what they're doing. (laughs) So it's it's finding, (laughs) finding somewhere in the middle where it's like that sweet spot, the sweet spot where you're, you're stealing 
forms and character archetypes that are that recur endlessly that kind of have to be a part of any comedy project in order for people to even recognize it as comedy that's really important but uh, right. i think people get confused at you know oh i guess i should steal jokes or whatever um you always have to make the joke your own and you have right. to tweak it in a way that you're seeing it in a totally fresh way just like any cliche you want to if if a cliche works really well there's a reason for that it was very well written when it was first done you should not use it in professional work exactly and, you know there's a fine line i think between cliches in movies like you mentioned the um the balls or the dick in the zipper you know somebody getting kicked in the nuts is like this thing that they still put in comedy movies and they put it in the trailer because it's like the funniest thing anybody's ever seen and i'm always sitting there in the movie theater when they show the trailer for the comedy movie where somebody gets hit in the nuts and there's inevitably some guy sitting next to me often by himself who cracks up laughing like that's the funniest thing he's ever seen <laughs> And I just look at him like, have you not seen that before? I'm confused. <laughs> like, uh, But maybe walk us through that, like the difference between a cliched humor moment in a movie and a fresh humor moment, but that nonetheless has very prominent antecedents in the comedy that came before. That's a really good question. I'm not sure. And, and it's such so good that uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to it, but I, I can I can guess at the answer, and I think I think I think it's the amount of personalization and and confession that you add to it, as opposed to simply um, dusting off a museum piece. So so you know I, I'm I'm actually thinking about uh, gags in which somebody has um, gotten a. a uh, kick to their nuts that that work. I'm trying to think what made that work. Um, uh, and right now, the only thing I'm thinking about is uh, Monsters Inc. In, in which the Billy Crystal monster um, uh, got. He, no one kicked him in the balls, but he did something funny, and it ended up with him crushing his ball parts. If they're you know, because he's a big big eye so the, somewhere where that would be um, he clearly but he, has no genitals of any kind it's like a very but, smooth but, but spherical it, surface <laughs> right but it was in that area right and but he did it he did it in in the way of trying to distract boo the the little girl who's gotten lost in the monster world yeah. so the getting the getting his balls crushed wasn't the end all and be all of the bit the end all and be all of the bit was that she wasn't looking when it happened and it was all in 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 service of 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 helping the moment of, of getting her through a, a tough moment so uh so i you know what i think i i think it's it's if you tell if you if somehow you tell a story on yourself, make the joke about you, L literally, you the writer, what, what's fucked up in your life? What, where are you at blame? Uh, what's wrong? You know, where, what can you confess to? And somehow infuse what might be otherwise a rote cliche with some of your own truth. I think that's... You know, I'm not sure if that's the best answer, but that's that's the best answer I'm coming up with right now. I like that. that. I think that's good. That that in in effect, a comedian is is the courageous individual who gets up in front of a large group of strangers and simply confesses to being human and basically says it's okay, it's okay, you'll live. I mean, you know, until you don't, but then you won't have anything to worry about. So until then, it's okay. It's okay that you're not the best. It's okay that you're not the brightest. It's okay that you're not the best looking. It's okay you're not the smartest. None of us are. Uh, so, so I think it's the amount of personalization. It's the amount of, of truth-telling that, that sets the banal apart from, from the really uh, inspired. Uh, the... the, the, the Moments in, in Groundhog Day that I love are moments taken, uh, and some of them aren't the comic moments. They're moments taken from truth. They're 
uh, there's this scene in which he's finally convinced Annie McDowell it's happening, and she's fallen asleep, and he's reading her poetry, and he he stops reading her poetry uh, at a point, and he just starts talking to her. While she's asleep, he's telling, he's unburdening his heart to her in a way that he couldn't do when she's awake. And that comes straight from a story that Bill Murray told Harold Ramis about a time in which, you know, after, after he got married and they, you know, it was a long drive or a long journey to where they were going for the honeymoon and the wife was asleep and then Bill Murray kind of told her everything that was in his heart that he couldn't tell her to her face. And Harold Ramis turned right around and put it in the movie because it was true. And it's one of the wonderful moments of the movie. Um, there, there's another moment in, in Groundhog Day is one of my favorite movies because it's just so rich and, and, uh, and it's so, I'm still angry 30 years later that, that it didn't get nominated for best original screenplay. Dave did. Dave. Com- comedy that. is never going to be respected in that way. I, I know. It's not going to happen. Uh, there's uh there's there's a great there's a great moment Steve Tobolowski talks about it on his podcast about how it was supposed to be this summer light summer silly comedy and there's this there's a scene in Groundhog Day when it's the second night and and he uh he's still not sure if it's really happening so in the in the in the script in the shooting script he shaves his head into a into a mohawk he uh trashes the room he paints it all different colors he splashes paint all over he wakes up and it's the you know sunny and sharon's the same day and when they looked at it uh, on the dailies they thought somebody had the thought why would he do that why would he shave his head into a mohawk somebody had put that in because wouldn't it be funny if but then they thought to themselves why would he do that and and Stephen Tobolowsky talks about it. from that point on, every decision in the movie was made by the thought, what would he do? Right. And so in the shooting, in, in the final script, he takes a pencil, he breaks it in half, he puts one end on the night table, he puts one end on the floor. When the you know cut to Sonny and Cher, you know singing, he wakes up and the pencil's whole, and that told the story better than the wouldn't it be funny excesses of let's shave my head into a mohawk. Right. So again, what would be the truth? What would be the truth of the moment? And what what saves comedy is the ability for the comic character, the comedian, to comment on the on the scene itself. Uh, and and that and and that's a way of keeping uh, keeping you from falling into cliche. So that if you have to have somebody kick somebody in the balls, uh, then you, another character has to say, really? Haven't we seen that before? I mean, some, some reality has to seep into the moment. Right, some, some acknowledgement of... Uh, yes, that, that, that I'm here, that this, is, that this is both a true story and an entertainment that we are both participating in. Right, which gets to, and, and a, lot, a lot of what you're talking about gets to a connection, like a human connection whether it's between the characters on screen or more importantly between the audience and what's happening on screen you know ultimately right. that that's why we need comedy in our lives we it, we use it as a way to bond to connect with each other to learn that hey this person's experienced some of the same uh, things that I've experienced and I'm okay like life is life is okay right um Exactly. You'll, you'll, you'll live. Uh, one, one of the things I like to say is that drama helps us dream about what we could be, but comedy helps us live with who we are. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It's been really uh, a pleasure to talk to you and dig into some of this stuff. Oh, well, thank you. It's entirely my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. For more comedy writing tips, tricks, and resources, go to howtowritefunny.com.